Deanna, thank you for agreeing to share the real you with me. Um, you were born on a Sheffield council estate. Mm -hmm. Clearly you're clever. You get a scholarship to a private school. Did you experience snobbery? Was it difficult to go from a council estate to private school? It was one of those things that um, my family and I were kind of worried about. I mean, I was only a kid. I was 10, 11 when I won the scholarship. Um, I didn't really know many people going to that school. It was the other end of town. Um, so I was a bit concerned. But the thing that was amazing is my family was so supportive. And they said, you've got this opportunity. Go try it for a while. And if you don't like it, we'll take you out and you can go where your friends are going. So I knew I kind of had that safety blanket. Um, and it was incredible, actually, because I was concerned, you know, being from the, the wrong end of town, would I really be accepted? And I never had a single issue at all. Um, there was no kind of public knowledge that I was a scholarship girl, so I certainly was never teased for it. But at the same time, I was really proud of that. I was really proud that the reason I was there is that, I, you know, I'd got in based on the entrance exam and had the support of um, the HSBC and the Girls' Day School Trust. So, no, not particularly. I think it was more that I was concerned I might face it. I think that was a, a barrier at certain points. Um, but I didn't, and people were incredibly supportive. What did your mum and dad do? Uh, so my mum uh, was a nursery nurse and worked in a bank for a little while. Um, my dad was a self-employed stonemason, so yeah, he knew about hard graft. Your early life is working out quite well. Then at 13, the most terrible thing happens to you. Tell us about that. Well, it was, it was um, a really difficult time kind of for the whole family. Um, my dad had gone out to the pub with his friends as, as he did on the weekends um, and he never came home. And the reason he never came home is because he'd been hit once uh, in, a, in a sort of provocation, uh, got hit in the side of the neck. The force was just enough and it hit at exactly the wrong point that it ruptured an artery. Um, and my dad was dead before he hit the ground, basically, which um, was such a shock. I mean, you can't really mentally prepare yourself for that at all. You know, on the one hand, you think it happened so quickly, at least he didn't suffer. But on the other hand, if you'd had a bit of a lead up, at least there were conversations you could have and things that you could have said and things you could have asked. Because I was 13 at the time and my, my dad was only 35. I mean, now that I'm getting towards 30, that seems a little bit scary. Um, but there are so many conversations that I'd love to have with my dad now. I never had a conversation with him as an adult, which is really strange. Um, and so I knew him as this kind of incredible, inspiring figure. And I think as an adult, obviously, I'd probably see his flaws a little bit, but I would just love to be able to chat to him and see what he makes of what I'm doing and ask for his advice and his insights, because he really was one of the most hardworking people I've ever known. And to kind of figure out how he managed to keep pushing through, through all the difficulties that kind of he faced, keep pushing on um, to do everything he could for me and my mum, you know, I'd just love to know kind of what, what motivated him and what sparked him. Um, and it's those things that are the, the hardest. I mean, at the time, it was horrendous for my family, my mum and my nan in particular. Um, for my nan, my, my dad was her only child. Um, no parent ever expects to lose a child, certainly not in those circumstances. Um, so, you know, we club together as a family, it's what you do. And I think if I can see any silver linings from it, it has made me so much more resilient. Um, and it's made me really determined. And I think it's probably what started the chain reaction of events that actually led to me getting into this job. Did you have to have counselling? Um, oh gosh, I did at the time. Um, Probably a few months after it happened, school offered it, and I thought, I may as well take it. Um, I didn't find at that point it really helped, and I think the reason, now that I can look back with a slightly more kind of grown-up and experienced mindset, it was too soon, I hadn't really grieved at all. Um, I was really busy supporting my mum and my nan through it, because, you know, they were hit so hard. My mum and dad had been together 16 years when he died. Um, obviously, my nan losing her only son, so my focus was on getting them through it, and so I kind of to an extent compartmentalise my own feelings for a little while. Um, and it was probably three years later that it actually properly hit me. I mean, I'd been upset in the interim, of course, but I kind of just pushed on and pushed through and I had, you know, exams to get through and things. Um, and it's when I got into sick form, I just realised I was feeling just not quite right and I couldn't really put my finger on why um, and was just struggling to focus on my kind of homework and all that sort of thing. Um, and my head of sick form asked if I wanted to try some counselling, and I did. And I, I think kind of realised that I hadn't really processed all of those feelings from being 13 because I've been so distracted with trying to support everyone else. Um, so yeah, I did, um, and found it, you know, semi-helpful at the time. Um, I think therapy can be a really good way to actually explore some of those feelings. I've had therapy as an adult, which has actually been far more helpful. Um, digging into some of those things that happened to dads, and subsequently actually losing my nan a few years later. 
being able to kind of understand how that has shaped me as a person and to be able to recognize that sometimes some of the traits I have are based on that, but they don't define me and those events don't define me um, is really important. You don't have to tell me this. I'm interested if you had to take antidepressants, but please just tell me what, what, what you feel comfortable in telling me. My nan was diagnosed with lung cancer and her and I were, were incredibly close, particularly after dad died, we got even closer. Um, she was diagnosed and I just had this horrific fear of losing another one of my kind of closest relatives. So I went into a bit of a spiral um, and the GP I had at the time um, now would have been really disappointed. But I went in and said, I'm really struggling. I don't really know what to do. Can you help? Um, and they basically within about 30 seconds to sign a prescription for antidepressants. And I thought, oh, OK, this, this must be how this works. This must be how I get help and I started taking them and they did not work for me at all. The, the first that I was on uh, made me much worse. I went into an even deeper spiral. It was really horrendous. When was this? How long ago? That was, oh gosh, I was, um, I think 19 or 20. So you're talking eight-ish years ago. I forgot how old it was then. Um, so, you know, a good while, but it was really difficult. Um, and I found that they were really quick to kind of get me in and out of the door. Now I've got an incredible GP who really kind of looks after me and I've been on antidepressants I think once since, a different one, they really helped me work and find one that worked for me. Um, and now I'm not because I don't feel I need them, which is great, but um, I think there is a bit of a stigma attached to um, depression and there's a stigma attached to people taking medication to help. And I think what people kind of need to recognise is that this isn't just people being emotional, this is an actual chemical reaction that's going on in someone's brain and if they can take something to help them equalise and level that, there is nothing to be ashamed of. Do you get depressed now? Oh, hard to say. I mean, I can always sense when I'm starting to go into a low mood, and now I have really good coping me mechanisms to try and get me through that. Um, so I go out running from time to time. I've got some of the most incredible friends who um, I've learned to actually open up to and who I know that I can rely upon to, to really help me. Um, I like video games, I play guitar. Like There are things I do that I know will try and help me get out of those moods. So largely, I'm in a really good place at the moment, which is really positive. Um, but yeah, it's kind of having the experience of being depressed and going through depression in the past means that I'm much more open to kind of recognising my own kind of triggers and uh, being able to cope with them. You are still young, um, but you've been married and you're going through a divorce, you're divorced, you're certainly not with that person. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Do you deal with that okay? It must have been painful. Um, I don't want to dwell too much on kind of the relationship per se, but um, you know, any relationship breakdown is, is difficult, be it your decision, their decision, or a mutual decision. I think it's always really hard. Um, and there are, it takes a little bit of time to process that. So it was difficult, but at the same time, it kind of fell not long before the election kicked off. So I was so distracted with really pushing myself. And you know, Gloria, as well as I do, how much you have to put into those elections. Um, and then kind of when I got elected, uh, which was an incredible kind of thing in and of itself, that for me kind of sparked something in my head that said, this is the start of the new chapter. I've got a new job, new opportunity, out of the old relationship, need to start looking forward. So um, yeah, it really kind of changed my mindset um, and really helped me to realise as well that I managed to get through that single, which means that I didn't need to rely upon a partner to really help me and support me. Now I had friends who were helping and all of that, but it meant that I knew that I had this kind of inner resilience and strength to do it as a kind of strong independent woman, um, which actually was really helpful for me and for my own confidence going into this job. A lot of my uh, friends who are MPs who are single say it's difficult to, to date. Do you put yourself on, a, on an app or they struggle with it. So you're, you, you, I don't know if you want to date or not, but you're young and at some point you will want to date. How do you, how do you deal with it? Well, I think ultimately, you know, I don't feel like I need to be in a relationship, but ultimately you do want to kind of settle down with someone. Um, and so I decided to get myself on a dating app. But having such an unusual name, yes. um, I thought maybe that's not the most incognito way. And the last thing you want is someone trying to match or kind of chat to you because they know what you do. I think that'd be a bit creepy. So um, I was on it in under a kind of nickname um, and didn't say what I did for a living or anything like that. So it was a little bit more kind of natural. Um, so I went on a few kind of nice dates, you know, dates with a few nice girls, a few nice guys. And it was just, you know, um, fun but you know realistically kind of didn't really make that connection with someone um but you know i'm seeing someone at the moment um it's going really well and i'm very excited about it um but we'll see you know the future is a very exciting place um but yeah i think i think 
it's just difficult because you are this kind of public figure as an MP and you don't want anyone to kind of take advantage of that for status or to, you know, share it with their mates and get an ego trip or anything like that. So that's kind of always at the back of your mind. But I think when you meet people kind of organically, it's all very different. You said that you've dated uh, guys and girls, mm -hmm. I think. Um, do we know that about you? That, that, that you're, obviously you're married uh, to a man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do, do, I, don't, I don't think I know that you um, date girls as well. It's never something that I've kind of really publicly discussed because I've tried to keep my dating life, you know, relatively low key. Um, but yeah, I've, you know, I've known that I'm bisexual for quite a lot of years, you know, all my close friends and family know. And if anyone were to explicitly ask me, I certainly wouldn't try and hide it because I don't think it's kind of anything to be ashamed of. Um, I think the reason that I haven't done a kind of, by the way, guys, is because I don't want being bi to be considered a big deal. You know, I feel like if I did a very public kind of coming out parade, that that would be me saying there's something really unusual about this and trying to make a big deal of it, when to me it's not, it's just part of kind of who I am. Um, so I don't know, I, I don't know. I think there are people who know, um, but you know, probably not as publicly as this interview. So yeah, this is a bit interesting. <laughs> it's really interesting. So you're an MP, you obviously really love it. Um, you've not only abstained, on a Tory whip, you have voted against the whip. Mm -hmm. You've only been an MP for two years. Um, I know when you're not in the same place as your, your party, mm -hmm. it's difficult, it's really difficult to, to either abstain or break a whip. Just talk us through what led you to breaking a whip and how hard that was. It's really difficult because you get elected alongside a, a group of people and you are a team. I mean, you know as well as I do, you club together so much with your own people and you don't want to be the person who's making things awkward for your friends who you know put so much time and effort into you as well as you do into them um but i think sometimes you know for me being an mp was not about being a kind of london voice in my constituency it was about being a voice in my constituency in westminster um and you have to balance off a whole host of things when you decide how you're voting you have to balance off obviously there is loyalty to the party that to some extent is very important uh, balance off what's right by your constituents and also your own conscience because i think you really have to be able to get up the next morning and look yourself in the eye if you voted for something that you found difficult. Um, and so uh, I think there were two occasions where I um, kind of couldn't do that. One of them was on the, the 10 o'clock curfew during COVID where I'd had a lot of conversations and I, I, it was a really big decision because I'd you know, voted with the government all the way through and thought overall the handling of COVID in that really difficult time had been really good. But I just couldn't see any kind of scientific evidence why that was the right thing. And I, there's a very special place in my heart for the hospitality industry. I got my start there and a lot of my family worked in hospitality and leisure. So um, I was kind of in tune with some of the issues they were facing. And to me, I couldn't really see a reason why that was the right approach. Um, so I broke ranks then and voted against, which um, was very strange. I mean, at that point, it was during the kind of virtual voting thing. So it wasn't as yeah. open. Yeah. But um, the second time um, was on the national insurance rise for the health and social care levy. Um, I'm really pleased that actually it's the Conservative government that's actually finally, finally trying to tackle this issue because social care has been kicked down the road for decades, frankly. So I'm glad we're trying to fix it. But for me, it didn't seem like this was the optimal way to do it. So had a lot of conversations behind the scenes, you know, really trying to convince government maybe we can tweak it a little bit, try and make it better um, and not raise taxes when we said we wouldn't. Um, and uh, ultimately, kind of on the day, I was still umming and ahhing about what do I do and then found myself um, in the lobby with uh, a lot of Labour and SNP MPs, which was um, really strange. You kind of feel like you're being a little bit treacherous for doing that. Um, but at the same time, I, I go back to what I said a minute ago, you have to be able to look yourself in the mirror the next day and feel like you did the right thing. Um, and I did. I woke up the next morning and after the kind of adrenaline rush of it all and the kind of uh, fraughtness of the day before of really trying to up and and decide what to do, I woke up and thought, I do feel like I did the right thing. And sure, I wasn't on the, the winning side on this one, but certainly at least I can look myself in the eye and feel like I did the right thing by my, my constituents. Would you ever like to be leader of the Conservative Party? Goodness, God, seeing what uh, the Prime Minister's gone through at the moment, I'm not sure, really. Um, I don't know, is the honest answer. You know, you do think about it, of course you do. You know, you kind of fantasise and uh, see kind of who's in at the moment and you think, oh my gosh, maybe this is something that I could do. But would I like to? Um, the upside is you get a chance to really try and shape the country um, and try and make it better, which is what we all get into politics to do anyway. And what better way than by leading a party and potentially going on to lead the country? 
But I think there are so many downsides too. I mean, that complete invasion into your personal life. It's hard enough being a backbench MP, but the fact that you, know, you literally can't walk down the street without being hounded by someone, either good or bad. And I'm just not really sure whether that's something that I'd really want to do. And certainly I wouldn't want that pressure put on my family. So I don't know, is the honest answer, which is a really rubbish answer, it's but it's very, it's very honest. Yeah. It's very, it's very honest. What, 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 when was the moment you realised you were a Conservative? Did you ever think about the Labour Party from she Labour Sheffield? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> I know, it was a surprise. Um, so I knew nothing about politics growing up, really. I just thought it was this boring thing that happened very far away and didn't really know anything about it at all. Um, and when I got to sort of 15, 16, um, kind of going back to what happened to my dad, I knew I wanted to do something around one punch assaults in whatever career I went into. I wasn't sure what. I thought about joining the police or maybe becoming a lawyer or something, but really wasn't sure. Um, so I chose A-levels based on what I was interested in, which were uh, maths and economics and French at the time. And I went into school and they said, oh, you need to pick another one. I was like, ooh, OK, um, great. So I looked at what was kind of left on the options, crossed out the stuff I really wasn't interested in. And there were four sort of taster sessions we'd had that were great. Um, one of those was politics. And I kind of went, landed on politics, uh, ended up studying it, which was a complete surprise. And it feels like a weird twist of fate that it's got me to here now. Um, but genuinely, I went in with kind of no view on which political party I would really align with. Didn't really even know what any political party stood for. I mean, I genuinely thought growing up that Winston Churchill was a Labour Prime Minister, so that tells you the extent of my knowledge. Um, and my parents weren't political, none of my family really were. Um, my grandparents were sort of your classic swing voters, but we didn't really talk politics at home. Um, so we started learning about it at school, learning what the different political parties stood for. And I kind of thought about the values that I'd really been brought up with. Um, you know, the power of hard graft, aspiration, wanting to do better for yourself for future generations. And to me, at the time, the party that really spoke those values was the Conservative Party. Um, so, um, yeah, I joined a few months later, um, uh, I think about 16 years old, and the rest is kind of history. You, you said that uh, you wanted to uh, campaign on one punch assault, mm -hmm. the one punch assault which killed your dad, and that, and that whatever you were going to do in your life and your job, that was going to be something that you were going to campaign on. How are you doing that in Parliament? So I uh, set up in February this year the all-party parliamentary group for one punch assaults. Um, so we've pulled together um, a load of people, you know, MPs of all parties, but we're working with a great charity called One Punch uh, UK, led by an excellent woman called Maxine, who lost her own son to a single punch assault. Um, and we're running an inquiry at the moment, basically, to try and investigate the issue. We're talking to um, victims who were left with life-changing injuries. We're talking to the families of victims who passed away, hoping to talk to some perpetrators, police officers, lawyers. We're really trying to bring together a wealth of evidence because... Um, there's been various bits of investigation done on this, but never pulling together sort of sentencing and victim support. And actually the prevalence of these assaults, because they're not recorded in a really meaningful way. They go down usually as assault or whatever it might be. So we don't actually know the scale of the issue. But what I do know is that when I announced the APPG was launching, we were doing this inquiry, we had so many people get in contact, to either say this happened to my family member, my friend, or I know someone who this happened to. And, um, so we're trying to, uh, before I go in with any prejudged conclusions, we're trying to really get all the evidence together first and then come up with a list of proposals for how we'd really improve things, mainly around the victim support side, but also around sentencing, because for too many people we've spoken to, there is a sense that kind of proper justice isn't done, the sentences are far too lenient. Did, did your family get justice? Not at all. It certainly didn't feel that way to us. Um, and I can't fault, you know, the jury or the judge or anything like that. Um, but the guy... Uh, pleaded self-defence and was found not guilty, which is, there was contradictory witness evidence, which made it very difficult so to prove. Nothing ha happened to the person who punched your yeah. dad and killed him? No, not, not for what he did to my dad. The least you can expect is, is a sense of justice. Yeah, you just feel kind of, you've lost this incredible person who's kind of so core to your life and then there's no outcome. It just, you know, it just happened. Um, there's no justice, so that's kind of what spurred me on to really do something about it. And I want to improve it so that other people don't have to go through the feelings that myself and my family did. You must think about your dad every day. I do. My dad and, and my nan, to give her so much credit as well. Um, she brought my dad up um, initially as a single parent. Um, she worked God knows how many jobs to, to get him through. And she was honestly one of the most incredible, hardworking, resilient, uh, but fun people I knew. So between the pair of them, um, it's kind of no wonder I turned out the way I did. And... 
you know, the sad thing is just that neither of them were there to kind of see this happen. Um, it would have been great to kind of share the achievement of winning the election, doing the maiden speech and all those things with them. But, you know, I'm not really sure what I believe in terms of afterlife, but I'm sure if they are able to be watching, I'm sure they are. So they would be so proud of you. <laughs> I hope so. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing right. the real you. It's been fascinating. Thank you. Welcome to the GB News YouTube channel. You can watch us live 24 hours a day, catch up on your favourite shows and join in the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and you'll never miss any of our exclusive content.